All right, you probably don't know me, and this video might come in your recommender suggested, but hello, I'm Dr. Skipper, and this is a Cartoon Network iceberg. Skipper, what's an iceberg? Skipper, what kind of bird is that? Skipper, look, 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 look. We'll pick up our all this soon, but please wait and hold on while I address the base audience first. So, the original Nickelodeon iceberg and even the Kanye iceberg really popped off. And for some reason, you guys chose to stick with a stupid bird who can't pronounce things right. And I'm really, really grateful, honestly. I'll talk more about this at the end of the video, but I just want to let you guys know I'm appreciative. And for the new people also watching, you can subscribe if you want, but I recommend you wait until the end of the video and make up your mind then. But to those who have no idea what an iceberg is, let me explain. An iceberg is a tier list covering most known facts to least known. And to those watching this video, this video is going to be more of me talking than attention span editing. So I suggest you clean your room, play a game, draw, or go to sleep to my crisp audio. I've joked about this being pretentious twice, but I'll do it again. Is this egotistical? Absolutely. Now with that, let's get to the first layer of the iceberg. The cul-de-sac kids are actually dead. This is a theory about the kids within the cul-de-sac and how they're actually dead. And how how their lives are held in a purgatory-like setting. According to the theory, the children from the cul-de-sac each hail from different eras spanning from the 1900s to early 2000s. This would explain why the year for the show is very hard to pinpoint. And also, there wasn't that many adults in the show, although you do catch a glimpse of one every now and then. So the theory starts with Rolf arriving first in the 1900s. The theory goes that his family moved to Peach Creek in order to establish a farm on the land. Rolf died around 1903 when his family's farm animals stampeded and trampled him. This was the supposed reason to why he has only one cow, one goat, and a few pigs a few chickens. Johnny 2x4 came to the cul-de-sac not too long after Rolf's death. Having no friends, Johnny took a marker and drew a face on a piece of wood, and dubbed it Plank. He died in 1922 after fighting a long battle with tuberculosis, six years before the discovery of penicillin. He took his friend Plank with him in the afterlife since that was the last thing he saw in life before he died. Purgatory would also explain Plank's occasional sentient behavior, which is most notable demonstrated in the movie. Eddie came next. He was born in New York, but eventually moved to Peach Creek during the Great Depression era. Always trying to get a quick buck, he always set up scams to get money for the cul-de-sac kids in an effort to escape the poverty that he spent his whole life in. Eddie didn't have a proper father figure since his real-life father abandoned him and his mother shortly after. With this came the big bro he adored and idolized so very much despite the later abuse of nature. After one of his scams went airy, Eddie was chased and swindled by the children of the cul-de-sac and ran to the lake and jumped into it. Eddie ends up drowning in the lake, and he soon joined the other deceased children in the afterlife. Although Eddie's no longer alive, he still tries to chase the almighty dollar, continuing his swindle nature in the afterlife. Ed and Sarah were the next to arrive at the cul-de-sac. Their father had died fighting in World War II, and as a result, their mother became distant and disconnected. To cope, Sarah developed her bossy attitude, trying to fill the role that their parents used to fill, before their father died and mom stopped caring. Conversely, Ed shut the world out and developed into fantasy worlds of comic books and monster movies, which exploded in popularity during the time after World War II. He relied on fantasy to escape his unhappy life. They both died in a freak car accident in 1953, thus joining the past kids in death. Naz was born in the 1960 eras to hippie parents. Described as a flower child, she was rather flirtatious, and would always act way towards the male children of the neighborhood. In the summer of 79, a serial killer escaped from a local asylum and made his way into her house and raped and murdered her along with her entire family. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, okay. Ed slash Double D was born in the 70s when preparing to attend college from a young age. He was raised by very strict and controlling and emotionally distant parents. They pushed him to succeed academically and to be perfectly clean and neat. He's believed to have died as a result of a gas leak causing an explosion in the Bunsen burner from his chemistry set. Kevin was born around the early 1980s. He was born to a broken down house. He had an abusive father who was poorly educated and his mother had passed away when he was a year old. Because of his situation at home, Kevin would act his frustration on the other kids at the cul-de-sac, becoming a bully to cope with his anger. One night in the winter of 99, his father fatally beat him in a drunken rage. While on his way to the hospital, his father was then convicted of murder and was sentenced to life in prison. These were just a couple examples. There's other pieces of evidence that point to this theory. For example, the children having green and blue tongues. And the tongue does in fact turn a blue shade when you die. Also, there's a complete lack of adults or even other children. Also, in the earlier seasons, the summer is endless. And the whole series takes place in the same era. Of course, if we're going to put on our realistic hats, yeah, this might be Cap. Where this does come off as complete creepypasta, I think this is also a little bit fun to imagine. Who knows, though, this shit might be completely fake and I'm just rambling about, you know, nonsense, but I want to hear your thoughts. If this was the actual conceptual thing of the TV show, that's interesting. But you also might think this is complete bullshit as well, so that's why I really want to hear your thoughts on this. Johnny Bravo and Bollywood. Johnny Bravo Goes to Bollywood is the name of an 11-minute short in an hour-long special that aired in India. Both the short and the special share the similar 
similar plot, but are very different. The short was a subsequent special that were made to capitalize on the series' cult popularity in India, where reruns of Johnny Bravo still air pretty consistently. The character has become something of a beloved pop culture icon in the country, embodying the over-top nature of India cinema. The special serves as both a parody of Indian and American pop culture, as well as a loving tribute to India and Johnny Bravo. Well, yeah, that's pretty cute. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, growing up as a 2002 kid, I don't know that much about Johnny Bravo. Don't get me wrong, I grew up with everything else, you know, from the chowders to the courages, to especially the regular shows and Adventure Times. But Johnny Bravo's a little bit out of my range. So to anybody who's older in the comments, can you tell me more about your reaction to this? I barely even watched Johnny Bravo as a kid, so, you know, you might hate me for this. You know, shoot me, my hands are up. Over the Garden Wall. Okay, this one is very personal to me. There's actually a video on my channel, and I'll even link it right here. You could click it. And this goes to my video about Over the Garden Wall. Over the Garden Wall, I think, is the best cartoon on Cartoon Network. It was a mini series, and it's 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 fantastic. It covers from themes of Dante's Inferno to talking about childhood, of uh, like childhood versus teenage years. It's beautiful. It's a well-crafted and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful show. And you should really watch my video on this. I'm happy to see this on the iceberg because not that many people know about Over the Garden Wall. Like, I mean, fuck, I, I didn't even know about Over the Garden Wall recently. I found it a year ago when a friend recommended it to me, and that kind of just changed my whole perspective of the show. Ted Turner. Ted Turner was the original creator of Cartoon Network in 2001, and then he was kicked out. That's pretty much it. I don't even know. I guess this is just kind of like a quick little quick fact. Sure. <laughs> I mean, he's the creator. I don't know what else to say. With that, though, that's the end of Lair 1. But you better stick with me because we're going to be going to Lair 2 right now. All right, you sticking with me? Okay, sweet. Boston Incident. The head of Cartoon Network resigned Friday following a marketing stunt that caused a terrorism scare in Boston and led to the police to shut down bridges and send in the bomb squad. The announcement of Jim Sample's resignation came in an internal memo to Cartoon Network staff members. It's my hope that my decision allows us to put this chapter behind us and get back to our mission of delivering unrivaled original animated entertainment for the consumers of all ages, said Samples, who was the network's general manager and executive vice president. He said he regretted what happened and felt compelled to step down effective immediately. In recognition of the gravity of the situation that occurred under my watch, dozens of blinking electronic devices showed a crude cartoon character that had been painted in 10 cities as part of a guerrilla marketing campaign to promote the cartoon, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. But when Boston authorities got a series of calls about the devices on January 31st, they feared that the circuit boards with wires could be explosives. Cartoon Network's corporate parent, acknowledged a few hours into the scare that boards were harmless and it was a part of a marketing move. On Monday, Turner Broadcasting and Advertising Agency involved agreed to $2 million in pay for compensation for the emergency responses and devices under spurred in Boston. The Cartoon Network is a division of Atlanta-based Turner Broadcasting, whose parent is media giant Time Warner. Two men who authorities say were paid to place the devices in Boston have pleaded not guilty to placing a hoax device in disorderly conduct. Peter Burdovsky, I hope I pronounced that right, 27, whose attorney said he had a videotaped part of the police response, and Sean Stevens, 28, are both free on bond. Boston police found 38 the blinking signs on Boston's bridges, Fenway Park, and other high-profile spots. The magnetic lights depicting crudely drawn Aqua Teen characters giving the finger. Those were also placed in nine other U.S. cities for a publicity campaign. But those magnetic lights of the Aqua Teen characters is giving a fucking middle finger cause a huge scare in Boston. The small signs had apparently been up for two or three weeks in Boston before the calls to authorities last week. So yeah, that's pretty weird. I'm gonna keep it real. I didn't know any of that before this. So eh, I guess I've already learned something, huh? Two in the AM PM. So two in the AM PM is actually pretty well known, but for those who don't know, I'll tell you. I actually also cover this in a video about regular show. You could watch that as well. But Two in the AM PM was a, an original short that ended up getting two regular show. It's about two store clerks who trip on acid and the voice actor for Mordecai turns into Mordecai and the voice actor for Benson turns into Benson. It's a cute little thing, but it's not a pilot. There's no connection to the original show or so we think. Of course, there's gonna be a theory we'll cover later about fucking acid and shit, but I recommend you actually go watch that regular show video though. Also, if you're a fan of regular show, tell me about it in the comments. Adventure Time takes place after a nuclear war. So the Mushroom War, also referred as to the Great Mushroom War, was an apocalyptic event that occurred roughly a thousand years before Adventure Time. The war crippled and eventually resulted in near annihilation of the human species that left the civilian in ruins throughout the land of Ooh. Not much is known about the Mushroom War or the events leading up to it, except that it ended with the Mushroom Bomb being dropped on what was once America, awakening the Lich and ending most of the life on Earth. The episodes Finn the Human and Jake the Dog support this, as Finn wishes the Lich, a product of the Mushroom Bomb, never existed. Existed. This implies that either some of the country used the essence of the Green Catalyst Comet to make the weapon, or it was a regular nuke that released the evil essence upon explosion. When the wish is granted, Finn is transported to a world where Simon has sacrificed himself to stop the mushroom bomb and freezes the entire Earth in the process. 
Despite some construction, without the detonation of the mushroom bomb, humanity continues to exist. Also in Finn the Human, Farm World Marceline suggests that the mushroom bomb likely concluded the war, as she states the world would have been annihilated if Simon had not stopped it with his ice powers. The war likely ended approximately a thousand years before the events of Adventure Time. Marceline's flashback in Simon and Marcy is explicitly stated at time card in this episode that takes place 996 years before, you know, the actual setting. So when it comes to Simon and Marcy, that's probably one of my favorite episodes in the show. I think when it comes to Adventure Time, it has a lot of lackluster side quests to do, but actual main story elements of the show are so good. But yeah, that concludes Layer 2. This is a shorter one, but I should also give you a heads up. So a friend of mine named The Hole in My Garden is going to be doing Layer 3. Will's a great person, and he has a great channel. And after you finish this video, I recommend you see some of his content. I'll let him take Layer 3 for me, but I'll see you back at Layer 4. See ya. Wait, what the fuck? Who the hell is this jackass? Why is the editing so shit now? How the hell do I get back to the bird? Are probably a few of the questions buzzing through your head right now. Hello, I'm the hole in my garden, and I've been brought on to do a few portions of this iceberg. To those of you wondering what the hell I am and why I was brought in here, I recommend you have a little sit down and hear what I have to say. My channel is one that looks a lot of popular media, specifically in regards to TV and animation, which if you can't already tell, correlates pretty well to the talking point of Cartoon Network. So that's kept the bullshit, you ain't here from me, you're here to get some Cartoon Network trivia, so in the interest of keeping a consistent flow and pace with the rest of this iceberg, let's dispense with the pleasantries and look at whatever stupid bullshit was put onto this iceberg. Chowder lives in Greek mythology. Fitting that we start this off with stupid bullshit. According to the minor and insignificant shreds of evidence that this theory posits, Chowder exists within the pantheon of Greek mythology. For those of you idiots that never paid attention in English class, Greek mythology is stuff like Zeus, Poseidon, Hades and all sorts. Even if you're not interested in mythology, a lot of those names definitely ring a bell. Pretty much the only evidence this presents as to why Chowder operates in this mythological continuity is a throwaway gag in the episode Purple Nurples, where Mung throws them over the city limits only to have them be picked up by a titan holding out Marzipan City. Once more, if you spent all your time picking your nose and shaking your ass in English literature, this reference will fly right over your head. If you're educated, or played God of War, You'd recognize this as a reference to Atlas, the great titan of Greek myth who was forced to hold up the world as punishment from Zeus for his role in the War of Titans against the Olympians. Fun story, right? Could the same Atlas be the character we see in Chowder? <laughs> Fuck no. Aside from Atlas, the show features no other parallels to the Greek pantheon in my knowledge, and the design influence of Chowder is as far away from ancient Greece as you can get, clearly taking more influence from Eastern cultures. When Kratos was slaying the gods of Olympus, the last motherfucker he would have run into was fucking you Chef Mungdal. I see it more as just a throwaway absurdist joke than an indication of a greater continuity. Chowder literally destroyed all time in one episode, it's not that deep. Cartoon Network invaded Nick. This one's probably one of the more interesting on the iceberg as it was just a complete power move from Cartoon Network. Both Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon have been rivals for years, both producing great shows respectively. And at the peak of their rivalry, Cartoon Network decided to exploit a loophole in their competition's advertising. Nickelodeon's ad spaces could be bought with any adverts from anyone, provided they could meet the criteria of standards and practices as well as the obvious cost of the slot. These ads weren't vetted through by Nick officials to my knowledge and were instead improved by standards and practices. Cartoon Network took advantage of this and paid for an ad slot on Nick to promote their Cartoon Cartoon Fridays programming block, with the characters in the ad referencing the fact that they're on a foreign network and not supposed to be there. Not much to add aside from that, but it's definitely a power move from Cartoon Network, veering Nick's primary demographic from their channel and towards Cartoon Networks. Don't see big moves like that anymore. Tom dies. Boring one. This is just referencing the amount of times Tom has canonically died in Tom and Jerry cartoons. There's a Tumblr article that highlights this in more detail. I'll see if Skipper could include this in the description if you really want a dissection of all the time Tom's been murked by Jerry or Acts of God. I'm not going to though, because I'm not a sadist. What was missing original script? Initially I thought this was referencing some shitty pilot for a show that nobody gives a fuck about, but no, this is actually referencing the original script for an episode of Adventure Time. The episode's out and is popular among the community for sparking the idea of a romance between Marceline and Princess Bubblegum. Apparently however, there was a banned version of this episode by the same name that featured a much less subtle insinuation that there was a relationship between the two. Standards and practices in 2011 weren't nearly as lenient on gay representation as they are today, so the original script was scrapped. The two's relationship has now become an official part of the Adventure Time canon, but back in the day it was quite an incident. Especially for Pendleton Ward's production company, Frederator, who had to give an official apology and a statement for insinuating the existence of the relationship in a behind the scenes video. Weird that something as minuscule as this garnered substantial controversy. Johnny Test Pilot 
Don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to add to the pilot of this dog shit show, but the rules of the iceberg dictate that I talk about this shit at least a little bit, so here goes. The original test pilot for Johnny Test. <laughs> never officially released as a full-length pilot. To this day, segments of the pilot exist in snippets, and surprise, the pilot's as shit as the show ended up being. Other than an Invader Zim song being audible during the pilot, there really isn't that much more to talk about with this one. Mr. Smoothie is a cannibal. Following up in disappointing topics, we had this one. I was super upset that this wasn't a creepypasta or a fan theory for something. Unfortunately, this one's just a fun bit of speculation or another case study in the art of reading too far into things or maybe just enough into things. I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with the Ben 10 franchise, so I'm not going to go in depth on that show, just so I can spare you all from needless preamble. All that's relevant is that a reoccurring brand throughout the show is the character of Mr. Smoothie, a mascot designed to promote smoothies of all things. And if you got a pair of functioning eyes and don't have a railway spike through your head, you'd be able to notice the obvious irony and unfortunate implications of a smoothie drinking a smaller smoothie that displays small signs of sentience. It's a funny thing to look at and point out to your friends, but once more there isn't that much depth to it. Candied Island is Ooh. This is a fan theory that I believe started from Reddit user the Narwhal King on the Fan Theories subreddit, so credit to him for the section. The theory posits that the town in Flapjack is a settlement established by survivors of the Great Mushroom War, with the town being constructed with makeshift materials or shipwrecked vessels. The Candied Islands that every character wants to go to is actually the continent of Ooh, and talk of the Candied Islands as a result of stories of Ooh being spread around and misinterpreted, with many believing that the Candy Kingdom makes up all of Ooh, thus leading characters like Peppermint Larry to nickname the single continent Candied Island. If you see where this theory is going, then it should stand out as an obvious point that the post posits Candy Wife as being an attempt to recreate Princess Bubblegum. Add to this more meta evidence like similar crew members such as Pendleton Ward and Patrick McHale. Surprisingly, I actually like this theory quite a bit. It's so obviously not true and only exists as canon within the heads of fans, but at the same time, there's nothing really to contradict it. So if you want to believe it, you can, and it makes for a fun bit of recontextualization on Flapjack's part. If you'd like to read about this in more detail, there may or may not be a link to the full post in the description. If not, I'll try and add it in the comments. Pizza Steve is naked. <laughs> oh boy, with a title like that, you'd expect something weird or interesting at the very least like a call for the parents to cancel Uncle Grandpa due to a stupid joke or something. But no, looking up Pizza Steve is Naked on Google hasn't really borne much fruit aside from a few unfortunate or funny, mostly unrelated finds. All I want to say is that I hope whatever sick fuck decided to put Pizza Steve is naked onto this iceberg is rotting in a jail cell somewhere. Fuck you, perverts. Blow me. Uncle Grandpa is Jesus. Oh hell yeah, with a title like that you'd assume I've got a rapture worthy flood of info to share with you all about how Uncle Grandpa is Christ the Redeemer. But I've got butt kiss, nothing, literally got nothing to talk about when it comes to Uncle Grandpa is Jesus. If I'm really stretching and just borderline bullshitting, this is referencing to Uncle Grandpa being an omnipotent and omnipresent being who's the uncle and the grandpa of everyone in the universe. But that's extreme cap, Uncle Grandpa didn't die on a cross and giant realistic flying tiger is not his Mary Magdalene. Unless any of you have anything to add about how Gus is a metaphor for St. Paul, then I don't have anything else to add. I don't know theology or the Bible back to front, so if any of you know what saint and or devil belly bag represents, then leave it in the comments, I guess. But that's all from me for now. I've got another layer coming up soon, so if you like early Christmas presents, wait for that. And yeah, see you later. Simpsons airing on Cartoon Network Philippines. The earliest seasons of The Simpsons aired in Cartoon Network Philippines from April 2006 to 2007. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, that's all I have to say. There's not really much to continue. We'll just get on to the next one. JBVO, your all request cartoon show. So this was a spinoff of Johnny Bravo that ran for one season from April 2nd, 2000 to August 26, 2001. And it was on Sundays. It was a programming block hosted by Johnny who would take in viewer requests of which cartoons to air and sometimes alongside some infrequent cartoon network guest, like Chicken from example, from Cow and Chicken. They would request through write-ins of the show or through the Cartoon Network website, and it could be any cartoon from Cartoon Network's library, with the exception of the half-hour shows, like The Moxie Show for example, which is also on this iceberg. It was another one of Cartoon Network's attempts at a hosted cartoon show, and was close to having a live cartoon character. And it also ironically premiered shortly after The Moxie Show had ended. And like The Moxie Show, it was arguably unsuccessful, lasting a single season and an episode for a year before its cancellation. It also received little in the way of resurfacing. Nothing of it since has been in the airwaves. Very little else exists of it online, besides a few episodes, segments, and promos. If you at all watch JBVO when you were a kid or something, tell me down in the comments. I don't really know that much about it, and I wonder if it was actually entertaining. Regular Show Acid Trip. Alright, this is like a Reddit thingy, so I'll read it for you. I know about 2 in the AM PM. 
But there's evidence that the show, as it exists now, is an acid trip. It would be kind of weird if it was in my opinion, but I also kind of like that it's mixed with some innocence, even if the jokes are a bit more geared at adults sometimes. I'm also aware of the stuff like the clock saying 420, etc., but that could just be a hidden joke rather than something that suggests that the characters are either stoned or experiencing an acid trip. What do you guys think? I think the acid trip theory is a little bit, uh, just fake. I mean, 2 in the AM PM is about acid, but I think regular show just has its own stuff. But since we're here too, I guess let's knock this out. Chicken wings resemble alcohol. Yeah, this is true. I mean, it's so obvious. Mofos be acting hella drunk on the wings. Courage is Cerberus. Courage is a scared dog with one goal in life, doing whatever he can to protect his masters. He has to protect his masters from all the evils that plague his home in the middle of nowhere. No one is really sure where nowhere is. All we could see of it is that it's a barren, hellish wasteland. Whenever the monster of the week appears, we could see Courage saving Muriel. Despite it being pretty worthless to begin with, Muriel often often sees Courage with another head, or Courage expresses emotions or warning messages by altering his body, giving him multiple heads. This is significant because the hound hell, Serbius, was said to have three heads. Therefore, perhaps Courage is a guard dog that stays in nowhere which is Serbius in hell, to protect his home keeping mankind, Muriel, safe from the evils of the world. And in this case, Ustas would be Hades. Tell me your thoughts as well, but since we're here, let's cover most of the Courage theories. From a dog's perspective, the second theory states that there weren't actually any monsters, and that Courage only thinks that they are because he was never taken on walks. This would explain why Ustas would seemingly not remember what happened to him in prior episodes. Muriel and Ustas were puppets. In the last episodes of season one, Ustas and Muriel were turned into puppets, which we saw Courage puppeteering while laughing maniacally. Some have Notice that this is after the point where the show takes the bizarre turn, even more so than it was before, with Courage acting out of complex plots. With them to pretend that they're still alive as he sinks further into the delusional state brought about the starvation and isolation. Damn. If you watch Courage, uh, what are your thoughts on this, I guess? but I'm gonna move on. The Amazing World of Gumball is set in a puppet world. Non-main characters in The Amazing World of Gumball don't seem bothered by any of the crimes and misadventures of the Watterson family. So there might be a theory that explains why for such a long time. In each episode, the story starts with the Gumball or Darwin harassing other characters in some episodes. Supporting characters usually get hurt by them or even killed off. However, the two never compensate their wrongdoings. Out of characters, Gumball, Darwin, and their father seem to be the only ones with paranoid mindsets, while other characters often just get annoyed or stay normal beings while meeting them. The theory is that the world of Elmore exist only in Watterson's mind, as a result of entering a coma during an accident. Throughout an episode Rob appears in, no one seems to be scared of what's happening unless Gumball is the subject. Many supporting characters are like, let's just chill while Gumball and Darwin solve the problem. Rob, the guy who appears as the antagonist of the show in later episodes, isn't actually a villain at all. In season 1, he's seen as an ordinary sociopathic kid who appears as a puppet of Gumball's show. However, he was chosen to be Gumball's assassin. While tending to assassinate Gumball, the world of Elmore is fading away, because Gumball, the creator of the universe, isn't there. Also, apart from Elmore, more, there isn't sign of any other towns. I swear to God, every theory has to eat. Somebody's a sociopath, someone's schizophrenic, somebody's just overall batshit crazy. Do you think Gumball's just batshit crazy, or do you think that this is just a creative puppet show? The hospital theory. The hospital theory is that all kids of K and D are patients in a hospital, and the nurse told them that they were a secret squad of agents to cheer them up. Number five's parents had divorced, and her dad left them penniless. Her mother blamed all the tragedies on number five and beat her. This led to number five being the mother figure of the group, as she wanted to be better than the mother that she had. Number four had come from a rough neighborhood. So he always had to be tough and aware of his surroundings. He was sent to the hospital with serious injuries after being mugged by a man with a knife. Due to number four's tough nature, he didn't back down and he was stabbed. If you're from England and watching this, can you relate? I'm sorry. I just, I had a joke. I, I had to throw in an English joke. Can you blame me? Number three was born to the family of drug addicts. Her parents would often abuse her and she decided to take her mother's anti-depression pills. One day, her dad shot her mom. When she walked in on the murder, she couldn't realize anything bad had happened since the pills heavily affected her mental state. Her dad noticing her stand there and shot her to leave no witness. She survived, but needed a liver transplant because of all the medication she'd taken. Number two was born to a loving mother and father who allowed his creativity to flourish. He was praised and cherished, but his uncle was jealous because he had the same abilities as a child yet never received any encouragement. Number two's uncle overfed him to express this resentment. Even when number two refused, he was forcefully stuffed. The boy eventually had to go to the hospital, and he was so obese that he would get seriously ill and had a high chance of heart failure. Number one had a dad with Alzheimer's disease, so he always had to look after him, though he didn't mind. His dad was a nice guy, and before losing his mind, was always kind of number one. His dad was the only adult number one like since his mother left him and they felt the doctors and nurses didn't care about his father and that they weren't trying hard enough to save him either. One day he took his dad to the hospital. Number one puked randomly. He admitted and it was discovered that he had cancer. God fucking, is this, let me guess, they're gonna say that's why he's bald. This led to him to hate adults more as he felt he was being tortured with needles and various medications. He acted like a leader to help the other kids feel better just as he did with his father. The K and D was formed to fight a war against adults as they felt imprisoned in the ward. The other members were of past kids who had come and gone while teenagers. Come on, this is this is all fake. This is so fake. If we're looking at number one, bald, shiny ass head, 
like, come on. Like, no shot. No shot you believe this as well. Well, that's the end of layer four. Thanks for sticking around. Don't click off yet. We're getting to layer five. All right, see you there. The Billy and Mandy theory. All right, this is a post, so I'm just going to read it out for you. This might not be a very popular theory because it concerns the show being about a dead cast of characters, and it probably seems incredibly similar to the Ed, Ed, and Eddie theory. But since the personification of death is the main character and the frequent use of the underworld, I think it could be. Everyone is dead. The whole town, dead. Billy's family is the new addition to Ennsville, so they are the most disturbed by everything going on. The grim adventures of Billy and Mandy has always been sort of a morbid show, but this may be shocking. Although we will leave the people in the show to be existing is wrong, they're all dead or imaginary. But the truth is, this is all inside of one animal's head. The animal's milkshake, Billy's beloved cat. What really happened one morning was Mandy was going door to door asking people for money for an orphanage. But when she gets to Billy's house, Billy's mom is having a psychotic rage attack from her schizophrenia and has tied up everybody in the house and has lit the house on fire. Jesus Christ. Billy's mom answers the door, pulls Mandy in and stabs her and kills herself. Everyone is dead except Milkshake, who escapes from the wreckage. Months later, Milkshake returns to the house expecting to find everyone, but doesn't, and goes into depression and creates his own world, where everybody's still alive. Billy is portrayed as stupid for him being the reason of the whole thing. He was bugging his mother, knowing she was in a very fragile state. Milkshake blames the whole thing on him, and this is why we see him screaming all the time. And this is why Milkshake also feels betrayed by Billy and can't get him out of his mind. Mandy. We see Mandy as this unhappy child without a nose, but there is more to it. Although Milkshake doesn't know Mandy personally, he could tell she had a rough life. Milkshake tries to make the thoughts of Mandy happy by giving her a friend. Though Milkshake can't make his imaginary Mandy happy because he feels bad for what happened to her. Grim is not just what Milkshake sees as Billy and Mandy's slave friend, but is actually the physical form of Milkshake's denial on that they are dead and that he can't escape that fact. He knows they're dead but just doesn't want to accept it, so instead he pretends that they're just friends with the core here of death. Grim is portrayed as smart and the one with the most common sense, because Milkshake wants to feel that his family's death was the best thing for them. Billy's mom. A lot of the characters we see in the show were created by Billy's mom, that Milkshake can remember. The demons in particular are the main ones. So there's many more, but I think I'm gonna stop this here. The theory is that just like the cat, the cat thinks, just, oh, why am I doing this? The theory is that everything happening is just in the cat's head, the shared universe theory. This theory is quite similar to the famous Pixar theory. This theory just says that all the Cartoon Network shows might be connected somehow. But how do you connect Chowder to regular show and then connect regular show to Samurai Jack? I think this is just not possible. I mean, the Pixar theory, you have some more things, but that's insanely stretching as it is. Skylar Page. The creator of Clarence was fired due to a sexual assault made on a female co-worker. Yikes. It was said that Skylar Page is no longer an employee at Cartoon Network, said a spokesman. And apparently behind the scenes, they try to blame Asperger's for being the reason. Oof. Kind of a pussy move to blame autism on sexual assault. Like, Jesus Christ. I mean, good riddance, though. This was also the reason due to Clarence's cancellation and also the cancel of a movie. Also, I guess since we're here, I don't think there's going to be that much Clarence on this iceberg, so I'm interested. Do any of you guys actually watch Clarence? or gave a shit about Clarence. I mean, that was kind of after my wave. I was there with the gumballs and the regular, like I said, didn't really give a shit about Clarence at all. But yeah, wondering your thoughts. Rude Removal. Rude Removal is a banned episode of Dexter's Laboratory that was originally part of season two. The episode first aired at the World Animation Celebration on February 21st, 1998, and it was later banned worldwide due to his excessive use of profanity. However, it later resurfaced as a limited time special on January 22nd, 2013, and then it was later removed again. In this special episode, Dexter invents a rude removal machine that separates his and Dee Dee's rude sides that make them be nice to each other. However, chaos ensues with their rude clones head out the lab and tear up the house. And Dexter drops some no no meanie words. Don't get me wrong, I've, I've, I've definitely used some no no meanie words in this video. And some of you might complain about it. You might, you might a little bit, but hey, look, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah, you saw that. Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig is a British preschool animated, okay. Oh my god, I'm really gonna talk about Peppa Pig in a video. Peppa Pig is a British preschool animated television series directed and produced by Ashley Baker Davis. Hope I pronounced that right. The US dubbed aired as part of the preschool block called Tickle You on Cartoon Network. You could also hear the audio of laughs of Peppa Pig in the US dub or Tickle You became a website. So yeah, Peppa Pig was once on Cartoon Network. See, my thing with Peppa Pig is I don't know why George cries so damn much. Like grow up. Is Frankie imaginary? In this 2014 theory, it says that Frankie Foster is actually a younger version of Madame Foster. The theory points that Frankie has similar clothing designed to his grandmother and that they seem to almost appear exactly alike. It is believed that Madame Foster created Frankie as a means of maintaining order in the foster home after she was gone. She loved the foster home and all of the imaginary friends there, but she knew that because of her aggressive aging, she wouldn't be able to maintain the house for long. This theory also points out how Frankie is never shown as having an imaginary friend herself, other than possibly the scribbles as shown in the flashback and that she never really seemed to have a life outside the home. It's believed that she dates humans either because she likes humans more than imaginary friends, or 
or that she dates them because she's unaware of her position as an imaginary friend. There's also an alternative take on this theory. For example, answers the question that if Frankie were indeed an imaginary friend, then why would she need a driver's license? This alternative theory also asks if Frankie was real, but Madame Foster herself was her imaginary friend. It's believed that the real Madame Foster died a few years ago and that Frankie couldn't cope with the loss of her grandmother. The theory also points out how childlike and energetic Madame Foster was compared to the typical grandmother, and that she typically acts as though she were like an imaginary friend herself. It's believed that Frankie stays at the Foster home because she wants to keep the charade up, also because she's still obsessed over her real grandmother's death. I mean, swag. Um, I'm, I'm here just as much as you, you know, so let's get into the next one. Frankie is the only real character. They really like some Frankie, huh? Warning. The following theory is way darker than the other two. Ooh, 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 ooh. I'm spooked out. I am so scared. Let's see what we are reading here today. As opposed to Frankie not existing in reality, it could be that she's the only real character in the show, leaving Mac and Madame Foster imaginary. Frankie grew up in a broke home, perhaps because her parents lived in constant bickering and not enough time to spend with her daughter. So she made up an imaginary friend. She would spend all her time with this friend, leaving her parents slightly worried, but concluded that it was appropriate for her age. But as she aged into a teenager, her imaginary friend remained her only best friend. Her parents took her to a psychiatrist, perhaps after kids at school teased her for her imaginary friend and she responded angrily. The psychiatrist helped prescribe medicine to help with what was proven to be a full-blown hallucination. As her friends slowly began to disappear, she fell into a deep state of depression, concerning her parents further. But on the brink of divorce, they had no time or money for the psychiatric visits. Frankie eventually finds out about the medication, which was kept a secret from her, and responds furiously. She ran away from the home blindly, with her mother and father frantically following. She continued running and eventually lost them in a bad section of town, known for drug dealing. She comes to a huge abandoned mansion, sprinkled in many of colors of chipped paint. But to her, after days of running and hiding without a dose of daily medicine, the boarded up cobweb infested mansion looks like a dream come true. She ran inside and continued to live happily as her best friend Blue returned. She made many more imaginary friends as well as hallucinating a family to fill her empty need for one. Mac was a manifestation of her miscarried brother, whom her parents had already named before his soon death. Madame Foster was representative of Frankie's grandmother, who was the only one of her family that loved her, despite the condition that brought up her hallucinations. Her days of joys at her grandmother's house translate into her new home, where she hangs out with ghosts and what could never be. Well, that's the end of this layer, folks. I'll see you in the next one as well. Let's just keep going through it. Don't quit on me now. Ben and Gwen are brother and sister. They have the sibling yin yang thing going on and even share the same birthday. Grandpa Max split them among his own kids to give them a dispart upbringings to prepare them for their inevitable destiny. Ben 10 is a comic and Gwen wrote it. We're just gonna be cycling through the Ben 10 thingies. By the way, if you watch Ben 10 as a kid, tell me, you know. Gwen 10, Ben 10,000, and Goodbye and Good Riddance clearly reveals that the events take place in a comic book series. Yeah, that's pretty much it. There isn't that much with the Ben 10 stuff. Uh, I apologize. The professor is Samurai Jack. The Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack belong to the same universe, and Samurai Jack is none other than Professor Utonium. One day, the Powerpuff Girls end up destroying Townsville while fighting their enemies, and that's when Professor Utonium transforms himself into Samurai Jack, the post-apocalyptic hero. I always assumed this was like a white fella, but hey, I mean, I guess he's Asian. Not racist, by the way. This is just an observation. CN Real. CN Real is a former Cartoon Network programming block that featured live action reality shows, usually on Wednesdays and Saturdays that premiered on June 17th, 2009, promoted by rock musician Andrew WK. It featured live action shows such as The Other Siders, Bobby Says, Dude, What Would Happen, Brain Rush, and Destroy Build Destroy. And the acquired series survived this. I have not watched any of these. The block was created so the network could effectively compete with Nickelodeon and Disney Channel, both of which had a large number of live action programming. Network Network executives and critics expressed concerns about alienating Cartoon Network's core audience with this block, which heavily promoted live action programming over cartoons. The concerns were well founded, as none of the shows ended up building any ratings momentum, not even breaking the top 10 programs aired on the network. The Other Siders and Survive This premiered on Wednesdays, while Brain Rush and WK's own Destroy Build Destroy premiered on Saturdays. On July 10th, 2009, the network announced that CN Real would be consolidated into a Wednesday night block from July 15th onwards, due to the overwhelmingly poor poor reception. Many shows in the block were prematurely canceled, except for Dude, What Would Happen, and Destroy, Build, Destroy. The block ended in early 2010, although new live action shows were produced. The CN Real block was ultimately dropped after deeming the block a critical failure. Following this, it was also considered an inappropriate idea for the network as Cartoon Network has been classified as a cartoon channel. Yeah, speaking about this, I don't know anything. I associated live action with like Disney Channel and Nickelodeon. The Downer. The Downer is the 36th episode of season three of The Amazing World of Gumball, an animated series produced by Cartoon Network Development Studios in Europe. 
The final product revolved around the Watterson family trying to cheer up Gumball, who was in an explicable bad mood. Gumball then gets mad and wishes for his family to disappear, which they and the rest of Elmore do. Throughout the course of the episode, Gumball slowly goes insane as he rocks around the empty town. However, the original draft of the episode was excessively dark, and the creator mentioned that because of that darkness, the whole episode had to be rewritten. As of yet, details concerning the original draft haven't surfaced anywhere online, and the only mention of it is on Twitter in a conversation with one of the show's fans, Christina Miller. Christina Miller is the former president of Turner's Cartoon Network Adult Swim and Boomerang, and is responsible for leading all aspects of business in North America, as well as global oversight of linear and nonlinear content. On November 27, 2019, it was announced that she'd be leaving Warner Media at the end of 2019. I mean, okay. I don't know why that's on the iceberg specifically, but I mean, sure. The Kitty Bobo Show. The Kitty Bobo Show was a short cartoon on Cartoon Network. The short premiered on Cartoon Cartoon Fridays on August 17, 2001, as one of the 10 contenders for Cartoon Network's Big Pick 2, the winner of which would become the next cartoon cartoon cartoon. The short did not win the big pick and was not picked up by Cartoon Network to become a full-length series. Kitty Bobo wants to prove that he's cool by getting a cell phone. Fortunately, he doesn't seem to be receiving many important calls, thereby reducing his cool factor, so he begins to fake incoming calls. Regular show cursing. This refers to when regular show used to have cursing in it. I remember a long time ago they would say crap, pissed, and like moron, but of course that got replaced. Non-stop superhero action. Non-stop superhero action was a special 14-hour Teen Titans Go marathon that aired all day on September. September 12, 2020, from 6 o'clock a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. The marathon celebrates the kids versus DC kids fandom section of the all-day interactive event. DC fandom, explore of the multiverse. It was a two-day interactive event. The marathon originally aired on August 22, 2020, from 6 o'clock a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. as all-day superhero fun featuring Teen Titans Go and Teen Titans episodes. The movie Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans and the all-new DC Superhero Girls. Half-hour episode in a 14 hours, but then DC Kid fandom was rescheduled. Fried Dynamite. Fried Dynamite, abbreviated as FD, was a Friday night slash Saturday morning Cartoon Network block that replaced Friday Night Premium Thunder. It was hosted by the 10-year-old superfan Blake Michael. In this show, Blake brings his friends on the show to help along hosting to bang out all the fun block skits. Blake's friends that appear most often, Camille, Corey, Ryan, Todd, and Mercedes. Blake has other friends that also appear on the show from time to time. I mean, sure, okay. Once again, don't know shit about this, but I guess we'll move on. But that's the end of this section. For the seventh layer, I'm gonna have the hole in my garden do it again. So bear with that. I'll see you in the eighth layer. Bet you all dreaded that this moment will come again, huh? The moment where I disrupt smooth editing and crisp audio with another one of my segments. But inadequacy and self-deprecation aside, I got a job to do and you've got a video to watch. Like an unhappy married couple, we're bound together. But it's okay, don't worry, I can be better. This layer's got better stuff on it. I swear there won't be any more Pizza Steve is naked type of topics. I can talk about cool stuff like... Gorillas in Cartoon Network. I'm actually quite a big fan of gorillas, so it's nice to see them make a little appearance on the iceberg. In case your only exposure to gorillas was your dad playing their music on the radio during long car trips, you may be unaware that gorillas is a fictional, fully animated band consisting of bandmates that don't exist past the plane of reality known as animation, akin to bands like The Studio Killers and next level irrelevant dog shit like the now defunct Your Favorite Martian. However, Gorillaz was a pioneer of these bands, with its founders being allured to the idea of creating a virtual band disconnected from the pointless and overly romanticized music industry. As much as I'd like to go on about Gorillaz music and animation, it's not particularly relevant aside from establishing that the band has ties to the animation industry. During the storyline of Phase 5 in Gorillaz discography, the band's main bass player, Murdoch, was canonically incarcerated in prison. Yeah, sounds complex and hard to explain, but that's the nature of the band's storytelling. Point being, to fill in the role, the band replaced Murdoch for a short while with the Powerpuff Girls character, Ace. Yes, this is real and this is official. The band got full approval from Cartoon Network to temporarily replace Murdoch with this Powerpuff Girls character. This was done because Jamie Hewlett, the band's real life artist and co-creator, liked the Powerpuff Girls show and felt Ace would have been the perfect pick for the band. One of the Cartoon Network approved the use of one of its characters with the band like Gorillaz. Whilst being music I enjoyed as a kid, it's most certainly not something I would ever call kid friendly. The first thing these peasants do when they get any money is buy some tacky show home and then fill it up with all this. Shit. But it's always cool to see crossovers like this, and apparently the band has more plans to use them in the future, so that's cool. Cyborg isn't a teenager. Just my luck I get an interesting one, only to have it immediately be followed up by a shit one. All this is referencing is a little factoid in an episode of Teen Titans Go that confirms Cyborg's canonical age as 18, making him by technicality not a teenager. Why would you put boring shit like this on an iceberg? <sighs> Fuck's sake. Getting flashbacks to my Robocop iceberg. 
Jim Henson collab cartoon. Hard to find stuff on this. When you google the name of this topic, you get the Muppet Show Fraggle Rock is the first result. However, there's no mention of the show ever premiering on Cartoon Network. Another result I got was for a show called Big Bang, which was a collaboration between Cartoon Network and Jim Henson's Muppet Workshop. However, there's no mention of Henson being involved creatively in the project, leaving this topic to be a bit of a dead end. Maybe there is an interesting story behind this, but as it stands, I can't see anything that would warrant further explanation. Ice King has Alzheimer's. Little plug I guess, but this is actually a topic in Adventure Time that I've been thinking about and wanted to make a video on for some time. I may still make a video on it, as the concept and storytelling the show uses to explore this idea is one that is intensely personal and one that I couldn't really do justice in a context like this. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try and explain it to the best of my ability here though, just gotta put my objective cap on and only talk about the cold hard facts of the subject. The character of Ice King is a mad and insane old man who fixates on things and assigns strange value or significance on seemingly insignificant things. On the surface level, this is done to solidify his crazy old wizard archetype, and allow for an easy excuse for Finn and Jake to give the old bastard a knuckle sandwich. However, this is all recontextualized when you discover that he was once a scientist named Simon Petrikov, who is a completely different character to his flying and snow-wielding counterpart. Where the Ice King is crazy and selfish, Simon is mild, subdued, and compassionate. The lore reason for this dramatic shift in character is the crown that both characters wear. Whilst giving immeasurable power, the crown also slowly degrades the minds of its wearers. Slowly but surely, Simon begins to forget large chunks of his memory, and slips in and out of being himself and being the Ice King. Which if you take away the ice power thing is a pretty clear parallel to actual Alzheimer's, which is especially reinforced when you see how Marceline responds to Simon's change from himself into the Ice King, mirroring a family member who's lost a loved one to the illness. It may sound fucking stupid considering this is an internet iceberg on Cartoon Network, but the mere recollection of this dramatic and thematic beat in Adventure Time is making me dip into real human emotion and empathy than my cynical and assholeish YouTube persona will allow. Going to get very self promo y here before I wrap this topic up and move on to the next thing, but if you'd like to see me tackle and talk about this topic with more tact and better writing, then be sure to let me know. Original Jake is dead. Okay, we passed the sobering, near shell cracking hurdle of talking about something heavy and sad. So now let's drown ourselves in figurative drugs and alcohol so we can repress the real self and get back to being cynical and taking the piss. What the fuck does this mean? Original Jake is dead? What are you talking about? He's right there! He's fine! Oh. Okay that, okay, that motherfucker might well be dead. But yeah, don't really know what this is referencing, but if you know then be sure to tell me in the comments. But that seems to be about everything I had to cover for this iceberg. Dropping my YouTube persona and being genuine again, it would mean a lot to me if any of you checked out some of the stuff on my channel and gave me the time of day. My stuff's mainly focused around media analysis, so if you're into films, games, TV shows and mild commentary topics and aspects, then be sure to check me out. As is probably evident by the segments I've done, I'm nowhere near as talented at editing or as good of a wordsmith as the shoe bill bastard that has so generously given me a soapbox to stand on. But I feel I get better with every upload and thrive off of feedback. Biggest issue I have is the feeling of talking to the brick wall, so I would really appreciate a subscription or a comment on any of my videos. So yeah, I'll hand the microphone back to Skipper. See ya. Rebecca Sugar. So the creator of Steven Universe made gay porn of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. And the big taboo is that most of the characters from Ed, Ed, and Eddie are underage. I'm gonna guess Rebecca Sugar was probably an adult at the time, but that's a sick way to start this lair. LeBron versus Kids Next Door. So there's a promo where it was just LeBron James playing against the kids next door. I thought it was kind of fun to include in this because, you know, balling like Kobe, but... Yeah. Tickle You. Tickle You was a weekday warning preschool programming block on Cartoon Network and briefly on Boomerang. The block premiered on August 22nd, 2005 and ended sometime near December 2005. Tickle You was the second preschool programming block that featured on Cartoon Network after Small World. Tickle You aired from Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The block was hosted by Block's mascot, Pipoka. Pipoka. I don't know how to pronounce that. Voiced by Ariel Winter and Henderson, who was voiced by Tom Kenny. You know, the guy who plays SpongeBob. But since this is Cartoon Network, yeah, he also plays Ice King. Let's give credit there. On December 30th, 2005, The Block and his hosts were removed. Though the shows continued to air on Cartoon Network, the promos for the show featured on The Block and Tickle You branding, along with Henderson and Pipaka, I think that's how you pronounce it, were removed and replaced by shots of the main view of the city of Townsville from the Powerpuff Girls. This was a short layer, but I'm going to conclude the video here. So that's the end of this iceberg. I just want to quickly take some time to just give my thanks that I promised in the beginning. Um, When I first did the Nickelodeon iceberg, I had a thousand subs, and recently we just 
just hit 15,000. 15,000. That's that's a big number. The idea of how much you could gain off of one thing is pretty incredible. And look, I'm not perfect. I probably got some things messed up. I c probably could have done more. But the idea of people just supporting me and watching me just means a lot. Like a ton. Like truly, thank you for sitting through this if you did and decided to watch this. And honestly, the best way to support me going forward is just by subscribing. I'm trying to hit 20k by the end of the month and yeah, that's kind of a long shot, but I don't know. I've always been a dreamer. Also, I want to give props to Will. The whole in my garden, he makes good content and he's extremely underrated. And he killed it with his parts on this video. So please check him out. Please go leave him a sub and just yeah, support him. He's great. Also want to say thank you to all the channel members and Patreons. It's cool to see you supporting me as well going on in the future. And all their names are right here. It's sick. I love you guys. Also, if you want to stay connected with me, you could follow me on Twitter. Also, if you want to, you could join the Discord. There's tons of people who also watch Cartoon Network shows, and if you just want to shoot the shit and talk with them, you can. Once again, thank you for 15k. Thanks for watching the video. It means a lot. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Boys, boy, turn it into sight.